so Neanderthal, all of these uh, other humans, they disappeared when the magnetic field collapsed. So we're kind of looking at that situation now. When I hear about climate change scientists and, you know, and NOAA or whatever, and or the um, climate scientists and blah, 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 it feels like a kindergartner mm -hmm. trying to explain what's going on with the weather without having enough data or understanding of the, the billions of years. Right. And, and, and no disrespect to scientists. This is what humans do. We, we, we try to understand the best of our abilities and make guesses. But there was a point where we thought that the Earth was the center of the universe. And then we kind of figured out later on, we started looking at stuff like, you know, mathematically, it doesn't quite make sense. I think there's a strong possibility when you, when you look at everything. I, actually, I'd say it's a 100% probability. We are wrong about all science. But uh, to be fair, 99.9. What we get right is what we can replicate. We can make video games. We can drive cars. So science does get us to these points where we can predict and make these systems. But to predict global weather, I don't know that humans have been around enough tracking enough data to really understand what's happening. Yeah, so let me combine these two ideas. And then, Brian, I'd like to get your opinion yep. on it. So going back to this, if you're going to really control weather, not manipulate it, not modify it, you're going to have to have sensors about every foot on the planet to understand what's going on from the ground level up to what, 18,000 feet, maybe 20,000 feet. The same thing is true with what we get fed with global warming, global temperature data. They don't have sensors everywhere. In the oceans, it's barely covered. They might have a few buoys out there. And we're talking about overall land temperatures. There's very few temperature data stations collecting data anywhere. And they're trying to say the entire planet is heating at this uniform rate in this area. But it's not. So, you know, I'll bring it back to you then. If there's not enough, if we can't bring it down to the square foot level, which we would also need to absolutely go into specifics on how the planet's heating or cooling, then we don't have that much data at all. There's, there's so much uncovered. Like what, how much uncovered area on the planet is there to try to extract this data from and then put it into the, and put it into the AI models? Yeah, I, I, I can't say there's, there's sensors all over the ocean. That would be probably impossible. But I think satellites are capable of collecting a lot of that data. We have but it would change the next moment that the satellite moves on a second well, pass around. It would have changed from what it, it, it had registered earlier. Yes and no. I mean, if like satellite data is pretty much with the technology we have, it's pretty much straightforward right then and there on the spot. And it can read it in real time. What's changing? So um, who post? Uh, there's someone who posted a video that explained these satellites, how they scan uh, the Earth in like real time, super fast. There's like. Uh, general scanners and there's detailed scanners within those. Uh, Ashton, uh, uh, talking about the yeah. infrared Forbes. Yes, Ashton, Ashton Forbes, Forbes, the Lockheed Martin. Yes, he put out a, there's yeah. a video. Um, I can't remember what global it's called. Heat, global well, heat there, mapping. That might be your answer right there, actually, on how to track things because that the satellites same idea, can do that. They're going they around can. the Earth and they're checking in real time using infrared about what's going on. Um, your phone is doing that. The tablet's mm -hmm. doing that, the computer's doing that, all your smart meters are doing that, your smart appliances are doing that, your PlayStation, your Xbox, e even my uh, Mavic drone. Um, you can adjust the sensors on it uh, to let it know, and they're infrared cameras, and they're, they're just as detailed um, as the one that you get to use, yeah. except for you don't get to record with that. I'm sure China uh, oh, for sure. you know, takes taking. all that data, but um, that actually is a, is a real thing that they are doing to the planet to keep track of everything. And it's, it's happening down here on the ground level too. And people forget that, you know, a lot of people are getting surprised because um, they catch their self in a security camera and then they see that their phone is taking pictures of them nonstop. Mm -hmm. But it's not just your phone. It's the traffic stop, uh, the traffic cameras. It's all of your mobile devices, your smart meters, all of your smart devices. Everything is doing that in conjunction. So they're getting an immediate, real-time, three-dimensional picture of everyone. So I don't know how you could uh, change that over to keeping track of like weather and things like that. Um, but what's all that going to do if our magnetic field does kind of completely collapse since it's moving around right now? Um, we have a good example of that 42,000 years ago. That's when all of the other hominids disappeared. So Neanderthal, all of these uh, other humans, they disappeared when the magnetic field collapsed. So we're kind of looking at that situation now. How do they study that? How do they know that? Like what evidence? Rock. They have, they have rock. You have uh, glacial information and different stuff. Uh, most of it comes from rock. They can tell which direction um, the magnetic field was going at some uh, at a certain time for lava flows, different stuff like that. Wow. Well, that and, and it's never the Earth. I don't think I, I keep hearing this thing about the Earth flipping. 
The Earth physically is not going to flip. The pole, the magnetic poles are moving. The geostationary uh, poles are not going to flip. The Earth is not flipping. It's just the magnetic fields. As a matter of fact, at certain times, there's more than one pole. There's like two or three north poles, two or three south poles. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there's no way that they could, you know, know what's going to happen in those kind of magnetic uh, environments. So if, if we have all that data, and like you said, we can follow these glacier movements and stuff like that and understand what kind of period we're moving into. Why are they pushing climate change so bad? I have no idea. Every commercial, like a Burger King commercial would be about climate change now. Yeah. Well, I, well, that same I, I information that, I don't showing think it is that, that way the ice anymore, is growing. Actually. So this, this came up Maybe in the, the debates. Internet. One, one of the big talking points around the uh, debate with Trump and Kamala was that climate change only got about 30 seconds. <laughs> and instead of answering the question, they immediately just deflected and, and started talking about something else. And... Uh, a lot of people pointed out, wow, when climate change can't get a seat at the presidential debate, it's no longer become a priority for these people. Right. One of the challenges for me is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly fine with believing that humans are polluting in it to a large degree. And, uh, you know, they want to blame the United States for it, but it's largely Southeast Asia and, and, and South Asia. So pollution is bad. But the problem I have is Barack Obama buying waterfront property while advocating for climate change, saying the water levels are going to be rising and things like this. Right. Mm-hmm. Certainly... You make the argument, yeah, but the water will rise over 100 years. But they've made even crazier arguments. Greta Thunberg said, what, th- four years ago, she had waited three years left before irreparable damage would take place. Mm. Now Greta Thunberg is screaming about Israel. Greta, Greta Thunberg made a video where she said, Israel is climate change because the energy companies, they are funding Israel. And it's like, so climate change is an activist thing is dead. Well, fundraising for it is gone. Greta Thunberg is pivoting to Israel because she's got no career in climate change. I feel like the whole narrative is gone. Well, think reverse. about this. Slide number 27. Um, you know, about 12,800 years ago, something happened that eventually caused the ocean to rise 400 feet. The Whoa, problem with so that is, 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 is that we had a lot of ice. Where is it? No, not immediately. Oh. It didn't happen immediately. But my question is, is where's all of this ice going to, where, where's all the water going to come from to, to raise the ocean? So, so. This, this slide is, uh, this is the Sahara, mm-hmm. and when was this? 6,000 years prior. So you're looking at present data versus 6,000 years prior. So you know, when you talk about water erosion on the Sphinx, that would be during this time, but you know, that puts the dating of the Sphinx into a question if there's water erosion at 6,000 years prior and they were supposed to create the Sphinx 4,000 years ago, but that's, that's a different topic. But it's showing you that the possibilities of the West African monsoon coming back in and changing pattern right now is one of the reasons we're seeing an enormous amount of floods across North Africa and the Sahel, which comes into the point where I would talk about if we know that certain areas are going to get cooler on the planet and will lose crop production, then where would you set up a new growing zone knowing that it was also in change to become more wet from the above ground water resources and then as well the amount of aquifers below that, maybe the Nubian sandstone aquifer or the Seuss aquifer, you know, we're talking about thousands of cubic kilometers of water beneath there that could be tapped and brought up to supplement the above ground water rainfall. And slide 28, it's just a little bit easier to want to look at as well. Just a little easier version for you. But you can see the, uh, the change and also the pockets within that of desertification and also forest, even though it's in the desert, you know, the oases is what people talk about. But you can see this Holocene change or the mid-Holocene changes. So we're coming back into a, a, a gigantic change. They're not building the new Renaissance Dam in Ethiopia that's filling to have the ha- largest hydroelectric project in Africa in one of the driest parts of Africa, unless you know the cycle's changing to consistent rainfall. So, so I, have, I have a question, right? You're saying that, uh, what, eight, six to 8,000 years ago, Sahara was largely forested? 6,000. 6,000 years ago. What, uh, honest question, what happens to all the organic matter as it starts drying up and decaying? Are there remnants left behind or mm-hmm. does it disintegrate into brittle dust or what? Well, that's part, but then the sand, because there's no more root structure to hold that, yes, uh, you, you'll find an enormous amount of, I wouldn't say petrified, but root stock there of the larger trees that's still beneath the sand and also the massive, massive amount of buildings, ancient cities, aqueducts and things that were through those trade routes there from over at the Red Sea all the way to the Atlantic stretching back. Wait, wait, you're saying that in the in the Sahara, there's evidence of ancient cities and all this stuff everywhere. Oh, wow. Everywhere. Well, you you ever heard of Michael Tellinger? I have. He does a lot of the South, uh, the Africa. South Africa uh, stone circles. Mm-hmm. That's, that's basically along the same concept. These are thousands and thousands of years old, and it's like a, uh, like sound frequency designs. They're not structures where people lived. 
These are like like power plants almost in a way. It's wild stuff. Michael Tellinger, incredible guy. They find pet they find petroglyphs out there in the Sahara that show hippo, giraffe, all kinds of stuff. We we know that that area was a, a wetland for multiple times uh, back into the Pleistocene too. There was all kinds of animals. That's one of the areas that man was first running around in in North Africa. Do we do we wow. have that graph of the? Remember we were talking last night about the Honga Tonga volcano that went off. And there's a, where all your water has been coming and from. Right, I do. Right I have over that here. North uh, Africa. If you notice it, that's what's uh, slide number in nine. Africa looking green right now. Slide number nineteen. And we could talked about the African mega lakes. You see those black, uh, those black structures in that last one. Those are mega lakes, larger than our Great Lakes. But this is the amount of water vapor that had been pushed up into the upper atmosphere, into the mesosphere from the Honga Tonga eruption. Now this goes through every single layer further down. And you'd know, Norma, this is in the mesosphere up around 85,000 feet. Look how much extra water is up there right now. Wow. Yeah. This explains wow. a lot of different uh, cloud Large. formations that are happening. And it, you can bring it down into the different hectopascals. You know, 10 is the highest there. But we get down to like 26 HPA or 26. Uh, now, why was there so much flooding after 2022? Yeah, because of additional 14% more moisture in the Earth's atmosphere ejected in a single event. And this was in 2022? Correct. Talk about cloud seeding. So what, what, do you, what, is, what do you think is going to happen? That It's going to rain a whole lot, and then we're going to get way more water in various parts of the planet? Well, not that, but uh, you, you could probably explain it better. Like when this water is coming back out, how does it integrate with the storms? Now, uh, you can ride on top of a natural cycle to get a, a larger output, and this is what I think you're getting into with trying to manipulate these weather systems now. If you knew there was more moisture coming in from the rain out of all the water, 14% more moisture in our atmosphere coming out at a certain rate, depending on how high it is in the atmosphere, Earth's magnetic field is changing, and then you're going to ride on top of this natural cycle and try to create a different outcome of these previously unattainable because everything is now, there's, there's two extra variables in there for you to actually manipulate on top of what you could do with the regular cloud seeding or what you're talking about with Nexrad over there, which I had a couple questions about the power output on Nexrad and the actual storm and the watts per meter squared from the sun. Now, this is interesting here since you're on that slide. This is the, uh, the Shepherd's Cross coming up on December 6th this year. <clears throat> now, electromagnetically, will it generate larger earthquakes, or is there a possibility for storm enhancement during this time? Jupiter, Earth, Mercury, Sun, Venus, Earth, Mars in this cross, and they call it the Shepherd's Cross. When's the last time that happened? I don't have a date for you. You'd have to look it up. It's something that happens. Well, so and so what is. is it? Well, if you, if you believe it's just strictly gravity, mm -hmm. if you think that the, lar the Jupiter being one of the largest gravity bodies, I'm more into the electromagnetics of it versus just strictly gravity pulling. Uh, Mercury as its iron core is well known to uh, shut down sunspots when they're directly Earth facing, so there's some interaction there. So if you have the largest gravitational body in with the Earth with a known iron core planet that shuts down or amplifies, it has an effect on solar activity in a line crossed with those other planets. So. What would you think would happen? This is a lot of science will be learned at this time. You know, people are saying, no, the planets don't have anything to do with generating earthquakes or seismic activity, volcanic eruptions, mud flows, nothing like this. But uh, we will see for sure because this is a very specific date on the sixth. So we can we can look out forward and say, well, this could have an effect. Thanks for watching this clip from the Culture War podcast. We're live every Friday, 10 a.m. to noon. So subscribe and come hang out.